Hello, my name is Richard Heritage. I'm a geotechnical engineer at ABG, and I'm here to take you through a few examples of situations where you can use a geosynthetic solution instead of a more traditional approach. We'll have a look at how much carbon is saved as measured in carbon dioxide equivalents, or CO2e, and how much money is saved as well. We'll also look at what the main difference is between these two solutions that gives you these really significant savings I'm about to take you through. The case studies and assessments I'm going to take you through are, firstly, the RAP report, or WRAP, produced by the Waste and Resources Action Program in 2010, which looked at a wide range of different types of geosynthetic. And secondly, a paper by Heritage and Shercliffe that will be published at Eurogeo 7, which is currently delayed due to COVID, which focuses on the environmental benefits of using drainage geosynthetics specifically. The first case study I want to show you is that of a noise bund at Axis Business Park in Liverpool. The original plan was to use gabion baskets. The proposed geosynthetic solution was a geogrid reinforced earth bund with a grid wrapped face. This is fairly common solution, also known as an MSEW or mechanically stabilized earth wall. This reduced CO2e emissions by 87% and reduced costs by 96%. These reductions may seem pretty unbelievable, but they can be easily understood once you start crunching the numbers. For example, the main reason for CO2e reductions was the embodied carbon of the gabion baskets compared with that of the geogrid. The weight of a gabion basket is about 320 times greater than the weight of geogrid required in the same area. So while steel may have around half the carbon footprint of plastic, on a per kilogram basis, the massive discrepancy in weight of material required explains the difference. When it comes to money, the cost of materials was reduced using the geogrid solution as well. However, the major difference in terms of cost was that the soil and site could be reused and this avoided 4,000 tonnes of waste disposal fees. The next case study is the construction of a large embankment for Common Head Junction in Swindon. The original proposal was to use imported granular fill to construct the embankment with slopes steep enough to keep the footprint of the embankment within the available area. The geosynthetics proposal was to use geogrid reinforcement, similar to Axis Business Park, but with about 45% of Site 1 Gork clay and 55% locally sourced Oxford clay, both materials which had previously been dismissed as unsuitable. So, not only are we importing significantly less material, but that what material is imported is closer to site and significantly cheaper. This reduced CO2e emissions by 31% and reduced costs by 55%. The main reason for the CO2 reductions was to do with the emissions from the transportation. The geogrid solution meant significantly less imported material and the imported material that was required didn't have to travel nearly as far to reach the work site. When it comes to finances, the same reasons apply, but in this case there was also the additional saving of using the much cheaper Oxford clay being imported to site rather than importing granular fill. Let's move on and look at a couple of retaining wall examples. Firstly, Hunter's Land Household Waste and Recycling Centre. They needed a relatively small wall to replace a failing boundary wall, but it provides a good example. The original proposal was for a sheet pile wall with concrete and brick cladding. This time, the proposed alternative was a reinforced earth wall with a concrete panel facing. This reduced CO2e emissions by 81% and reduced costs by 53%. In this case, the significant reduction in carbon footprint was due to the difference between the embodied carbon of sheet piles compared to that of the geosynthetic reinforcing. The footprint of the concrete panels and the concrete brick facing of the sheet piles was roughly equivalent, so the main difference was between the geosynthetics used compared to sheet piles. So when you're comparing tons of steel sheet piles with just kilograms of geosynthetics, it becomes clear why there's such a large difference between the carbon footprints of each solution. And from a financial point of view, the material cost of the reinforcing of the concrete panels was half that of the sheet piles and the cladding. All the examples I've just discussed came from the RAP report I mentioned earlier, and they're just a selection of the case studies available in the report. Now let's look at a couple of examples from the Heritage and Shercliffe paper which looks specifically at drainage geosynthetics. Firstly, this paper discusses a case study undertaken for the A14. The 
There are quite a number of bridges to be constructed as part of the project, and the original plan was to use either hollow concrete blocks or no finds concrete to provide back of wall drainage. The proposed alternative is a drainage geosynthetic, which consists of an HDPE core, which provides water flow, and then a geotextile is laminated to one or both sides to prevent soil from getting into the core. This reduced CO2 emissions by a staggering 92 to 97 percent, depending on whether you're comparing it to the concrete blocks and gravel or the no-finds concrete, and reduced costs by 83 to 88 percent. The main reason for this seemingly unbelievable reduction in CO2 emissions is twofold. Firstly, the embodied carbon of 60 kilograms of drainage composite compared with 18,000 kilograms of hollow concrete blocks and drainage gravel, or 28,000 kilograms of no finds concrete, on a per abutment scale, this makes a huge difference, as I'm sure you can imagine. Second is the carbon footprint from emissions during transportation. One truckload of drainage geocomposite is roughly equivalent to 300 truckloads of drainage gravel. And then of course, there's the 83 to 88% reduction in cost between the traditional solutions and the drainage geocomposite that provides equivalent drainage performance. The second example from the Heritage and Shercliffe paper that I want to discuss is edge of carriageway drainage. Surface water drains at the edge of road carriageways are typically constructed by lining a trench with geotextile and placing a perforated pipe at the bottom. You then backfill with porous gravel. The proposed geosynthetic alternative is a fin drain, which needs a much narrower trench, no additional geotextile lining, as there's already a geotextile laminated to the fin drain, and the trench can just be backfilled with what you dug out of the ground. By using a drainage geocomposite, carbon emissions were reduced by 74% and costs were reduced by 80%. The main reason for the reduction in CO2e emissions in this case is the embodied carbon in manufacture and transportation of the drainage geocomposite compared with the embodied carbon of quarrying, processing and transporting no finds drainage gravel. In this example, the weight of imported materials that the traditional method is over a thousand times greater than that of the drainage geocomposite solution. To summarize, the use of geosynthetic solutions allows you to reuse otherwise unsuitable material, reduce the required volume of imported materials, massively reduce the carbon footprint of the project, and save money. In civil engineering, the use of drainage geosynthetics is part of the solution to the climate emergency. For anyone who didn't see me at the start of our session, I am Richard Carr. Today I'm going to discuss the method of road maintenance which has environmental and financial benefits to clients and clients include trunk road operators down to local authorities and private road operators alike. A lot has been covered regarding government policy in our presentations today. One area often overlooked hiding in the background but which affects us all is road maintenance, which for many is a very controversial subject, especially in areas with a high percentage of rural and unclassified road, which are often overlooked in favour of higher profile of busier and classified roads. The image shown uh, you can see behind me, is not an uncommon sight in the UK. It's a concrete surface with large cracks and extensive repairs to keep the surface safe. How maintenance itself is a very broad discipline with many processes to keep us safe, including gully emptying and street cleaning, but the subject of my presentation today is road resurfacing. We all use roads in one way or another, as drivers, cyclists, or users of public transport. And road surface condition has a significant impact on us with the onus on clients to keep us on our roads in safe condition. The photo you can see in the background here is a very poor condition rural road. It was a road that's actually founded on peat and had a very poor surface condition with a lot of uh, movement in the carriageway. My presentation today is based around a highway maintenance scheme where road reinforcement is used in place of traditional full reconstruction. Road reinforcement in this session is using a glass fibre grid within the road pavement layers. That is, between layers of bound pavement rather than what is more common, and that is placing grids within the unbound pavement layers. Full reconstruction, i.e. removing all bound layers back to granular materials, has significant environmental impact and is financially costly and disruptive to businesses and residential alike, as the process is very time, in is very time intensive. The image on your screen now shows a poor condition of a local authority road called Meltham Mills Road. The photo is prior to rehabilitation 
where there is extensive cracking, potholing and rutting present along the entire length of the road. The road is heavily used by HGV, HGV vehicles as it serves a large industrial estate. The road also suffered from many failed utility reinstatements, which can be seen in the image on your screen, with significant joint failure and regular potholes forming along the joints with the existing, with the, where the existing road, which often needed urgent repairs as were in wheel track locations, as shown on the photo behind me. ABG, in conjunction with the local authority, finalised the design of the scheme, which is known as Meltham Mills Road, where the road was treated in part with glass fibre asphalt reinforcement system and in areas with a standard treatment to demonstrate the effectiveness of the asphalt reinforcement system. Most road maintenance schemes involve an element of planing, as shown in the image behind me, that's removal of the old bound layers, with depth of this varying considerably depending on the condition of the road, the existing road makeup and the design life required by the client. Planing is ideally kept to a minimum as removed materials are often sent to landfill and some older roads are actually built using tar bound material which cannot be recycled as it is classified as hazardous waste so overlaying such a road is far more preferable treatment than planing. Once the road has been planed out the road was then prepared to receive the new surfacing materials with a regulating course to provide a good surface on which to install the glass fibre reinforcement system. The next stage in the process is to apply a bonding agent which will bond the reinforcement system to the receiving surface and also provide a strong bond to the overlay material which in this case was a single layer of a surface coarse material. Common bonding agents are bitumen emulsion but your pure bitumen is also a permitted material. Bitumen it can be applied in a number of methods but the spray tank is shown on the image here is the best for accuracy and also for speed. Reinforcement systems such as glass fibre systems shown in the scheme can be applied by, by machine or if this is not possible due to access or difficult shapes hand application can be used. In the case of Meltham Mills Road machine application was used which provided a quick and efficient installation. Whilst the use of reinforcement systems is innovative the asphalt overlay process is exactly the same as that where roads are resurfaced without grids. When properly installed reinforcement grids do not move during the asphalting process and standard surfacing materials are used and no specialist asphalts are required. The image on the screen that you can see behind me shows a standard paving machine and lorry process. Once the asphalt material has been installed it is then compacted using standard road rollers to normal compaction specification. And the image that you see now is the road after surfacing works were completed. As part of the project, CO2 benefits were calculated comparing traditional road resurfacing versus the reinforced inlay option, which was calculated to give a substantial saving of 59.3% in CO2 reduction. After 10 years of monitoring, the scheme benefits of reinforcement identified in this trial are very obvious. The section you can see here on the left hand side shows an unreinforced section and to the right a reinforced section of the road and the benefit is clear to see that no cracking is present. As part of the trial financial studies were carried out to validate the cost of adding reinforcement into a road pavement. Grid reinforcement can't stop surface problems such as skid resistance but by preventing cracking and reducing the need for, uh, for patching repairs a financial saving of 21% was identified by using the reinforcement over the lifetime of the road. Cracking is a major enemy of roads as it allows water ingress which rapidly speeds up surface deterioration through the action of water and also freeze thaw. The present day uh, reinforced sections of the road are performing well with unreinforced sections showing significant cracking and delamination which require ongoing costly patching work. We hope you enjoyed our talk demonstrating how the use of geosynthetics can not only save you money but most importantly it can significantly reduce the carbon footprint of highways projects. If you have any questions or would like to learn any more please do feel free to get in touch and thank you for listening.